Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy podcast. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a newer, stronger foundation essential in creating your meaningful legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. As much as you like this podcast, I'm certain that you're going to love the book that I just released on Amazon, Fuel Your Legacy, The Nine Pillars to Build a Meaningful Legacy. I wrote this to share with you the experiences that I had while I was identifying my identity, how I began to create my meaningful legacy and how you can create yours. You're going to find this book on Kindle, Amazon, and as always on my website, samnickerbacher.com. Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy show. And today we have another just wonderfully pleasant guest on. His name is Gus Castro. And so one of the cool thing about the people that I bring on here is they all have different stories. Um, you may have seen in the messaging or recently that um, we, we've clarified the brand a little bit uh, of Fuel Your Legacy. And again, the, the purpose of the, the show is to because I believe that you are worth being remembered uh, and and the moment that you believe that and you actually go for it, that's what we want, we want to do. We want to help people believe that they're worth being remembered and that they're willing to go for it. So that's what we're going to talk about today with Gus. Um, Gus is actually originally from Mexico, made his way uh, from Mexico all the way to being one of the senior engineers uh, for Microsoft. Finally got bored of that or, or decided that he just we're going to find out exactly what happened, but decided he wanted something more out of life and uh, found that he could achieve his goals and his dreams if he was uh, doing something that gave him more time freedom. And he found that in real estate. So we've had a few real estate people on over time. What I like about it is everybody has their own reasons. Everybody has their own belief of why they believe they're worth being remembered. And that's really what we're going to dive in today. Um, But yeah, he's, he's helped Tons of people, over 600 plus people made uh, seven figures a year um, in his business. Just super passionate and excited to help you reach your goals. And maybe that's the real estate. Maybe it's not. Obviously, that's his expertise. But Gus, thank you so much for uh, for hopping on this show this morning. I know you're busy, um, but I appreciate your time. Go ahead and share with us um, what that journey was like for you. When did you decide, you know, I'm worth being remembered? And, and how did you actually put that into action? Yeah, Sam, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, you know, and, and I love that brand. I love that focus, right, that you have on the show because it really got me thinking, what, 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 is it, what have I done really that, 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 I, you know, that I think is worth remembering? And it starts from where I'm, I, I'm from, right? So I'm originally born and raised in Mexico in, in, in a city called Tijuana. It's on the border with San Diego. That's why I have like a, like a Southern California accent. Yeah, Andy's that's, super you know, white. He's not even <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. A hundred percent, hundred percent. And the reason for that is, you know, I grew up on the border. My cousins, most of my cousins, a lot of my family was in Southern California and they'd make fun of you if you spoke, you know, English, like, you know, like I grew up from Mexico, I make fun of the accents. I'm like, Hey, accent over, right. That's what a, a really good way to, to, uh-huh. train, to train yourself. Um, so I grew up in that environment, uh, you know, uh, looking at the U S living near the U S seeing the U S but not being part of it. Right. So, I went to school down in Mexico and then I got an opportunity. I studied engineering. I went into the hottest thing that was at that moment being a, a computer engineer. It was the late nineties, right? The internet boom was at its peak. And then I jumped in there and I ended up that when I graduated getting an offer from Microsoft. So Microsoft recruited in my university in Mexico because they were looking for people everywhere at that time. And like, Hey man, I, I, this is my ticket. I'm going to make it to the U S I'm going to make it to the big leagues. And this is my dream come true, my, 100% my dream come true. So I, jo- I moved to the Seattle in 2004, and then I got married and moved my wife up there, who was in Mexico in 2006. And, you know, in, in every aspect, I was living the dream, right? The, the, the six-figure salary, the house, the cars, you know, everything, the sport, you know, the, 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 the country club, you know, everything, everything. I was a member of the biggest private, you know, sports club in America as part of me and my Microsoft, all these perks, man. It was amazing. Microsoft's an amazing company. What I realized though, Sam, and this is what, when I turned about 26, 27 is that I was living the dream, but it wasn't my dream. It wasn't my dream. And I think everyone in their mid twenties has some moment like that, unless you're lucky enough to be where you want to be and where you should be. That's great. That's awesome. For the 99% that aren't, you kind of have a feeling that is, is this all there is? Is this, what's the next thing? Is this really where I'm meant to be? 
Is this what I'm passionate about? Is this what gets me excited and ready to go like the next day? I, I run towards it. And I had to, and, and this was not easy for me, by the way, right? Because my parents loved that I was in Microsoft. My like high school loved that I had gone to Microsoft. Like they celebrated these things. This was huge for my community, right? In that area. And like, wow, Gus is amazing. He's the story of success. He made it. He made it. And I was like, well, you know, I made it, but I kind of realized this is not really my thing, right? So I slowly, slowly, I realized that, you know what? I got to make a change because I'm, I'm too young to plateau in my career. And when you're not where you're supposed to be, Sam, things get harder, right? Things get harder. You're not excited. You, you, you don't advance as fast as you want. And you start being, you know, passed by people that are where they're supposed to be. People that are where they are supposed to be are going to be more passionate, more excited, have more energy, and they're just going to start to kind of pass in your career and you're going to plateau at some point. So when I realized that's what was going to happen to me, it became a no brainer for me to make a change. And in 2008, my wife got licensed as a real estate agent, which ended up being huge uh, for her. I didn't know it was going to be huge for me, but it was. Uh, the world was ending in 2008. People, I don't know if people remember that. There was a huge economic crisis just starting at that point. My wife was the rookie of the year, and she only sold like eight houses that year. So that's kind of where things were going. Um, and then in 2000, 2009, uh, you know, I don't even remember how many deals she had. Well, I think it was less than that. Um, you know, and she was still like one of the top producers. So that's where the market was in, completely in the tank. Uh, for the next couple of years. Uh, but, you know, little by little, uh, things started moving around. Like investors started jumping into the marketplace. Distressed properties started becoming easier to move and unload. All these things happening. And I became more passionate about that. That seemed more interesting to me than working day to day at Microsoft. It was more talking to people, building relationships, making deals happen. And that spoke to me. I'm like, you know what? I am more excited about doing this nights and weekends, real estate thing, than I am about my nine to five job, right? Well, in Microsoft, it was like nine to nine. My nine to nine job, I'm much more excited about this uh, uh, than anything else I'm doing. So in 2013, this is almost 10 years later after I joined Microsoft, I left, right? And it was like, you know, I don't know if people know much about high tech, but they do everything they can to entice you to stay. Like all your compensation is tied to how long you're in the company, right? Like all your stock options and all your incentives vest over time. So I had to walk away from a pretty nice package, uh, just kind of go off on my own. And, you know, that's what I did in 2013. And I, I have not looked back. I started a company. I, I real, first, I started a real estate team, just me and my wife. Then we built it up to five people, about 12 million in volume a year. And then in 2015, I touched a new model, something different that was called the inside sales agent model for real estate. It was something I didn't know about. I liked it. I loved it. I loved its scalability. And I built a new company, right? Had my real estate team and I built a company called Power ISA, which is what I run now. And today, this, as of this morning, we're 85 uh, people. It's an 85 person team. We're servicing all of the US and Canada. That is a business that I've been able to grow from zero, bootstrapped to seven figures a year. Um, and, and that's where I'm right now. So uh, it's, been, it's, been, it's been a ride, it's been a while. Um, so, and, and it's been kind of a, kind of a, a challenging uh, process, right? There's, there's been a few key moments where uh, things could have gone either way, right? One of the key moments, and as, as you know, as I was coming on your show and I'm thinking, what has been like, like, cause all, all that story I think is, I think is great. It's interesting. It's, there's some key points in there, but I don't think that's what I'm going to be remembered by. Right. I, that's not my legacy yet. It wasn't yet. What I did with this new company is what I feel that I'm going to be remembered by because of the amount of people I've been able to impact. I started this company in Mexico with folks that came back from the US, repatriated, even US citizens living in Mexico that spoke awesome English and they were calling and doing stuff for the US and Canada. But in Mexico, there's a different culture around business in Mexico. There's a different um, you know, expectation from employees to their bosses, right? It's a very adversarial relationship, typically, typically. And this is just the way things are. People accept this as the way things are. So me coming from the US, I had never worked in Mexico before 2015, by the way. I never had a job in my home country in my life. I came back at age 34, uh, 34 um, and like, let's start a business, man. Let's do this. And it was like hitting again, going against a brick wall, right? But, but I said, you know what? There's a way to do business here. There's a way to have your employees are your enemies, essentially. And there's all these legal structures and systems and processes you can put in place 
to, 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 to make sure that your employees are going to be your enemies, right? And I said, I want to run my business differently. I do not want to do all these outsourcing, a benefit changing, weird structures to make sure that I don't have to pay my employees more than the absolute minimum. I don't want that. I'm going to get the absolute minimum effort from my team. That's the only thing you're going to guarantee. I'm going to bring that U.S. high tech values, that culture, that openness, that transparency into this country. Right. And if I'm going to go broke, I'm going to go broke on those terms. It's not going to work. Well, that's too bad. Right. And, and if it, and if it works, it's going to work. And if it doesn't work, well, then I die trying. I'm going to go back to Microsoft. Right. <laughs> that's the worst. That was my worst case scenario. It wasn't bad, man. It was not, I could do, I could think of worse outcomes than that. Um, so I went for it and I said, this is the way I want to run a company. And my, my, you know, my family, business partners, you know, friends said, you're nuts. This is never going to work. You don't know these people, you know, workers here are very difficult. You know, they're lazy. You don't want to do things. This is not going to work, guys. This is, you're, you're doing it wrong, right? You're never going to find enough talent. You're never going to be able to pay them enough. It's never going to work. You're setting yourself up for failure. Well, that was 2015. Now we're in 2020. I've got 85 people and I've built a massive business uh, uh, here. So I'm here to tell you, you can do it a different way. You can actually be fair, be transparent, be open with people, build an open culture of collaboration where, yes, just because you're the CEO and the founder doesn't mean you can't talk to every single person on the team and that they can't approach you. And part of our culture as a company is that I get to talk to everyone, right? And we're on a first name basis. That's very innovative in Mexico. <laughs> like, hey, I can actually talk to the owner and he's going to respond back to me, right? And we have all hands meetings. When there was 10 of us in the room, literally you could fit us all in a small room. Now that there's almost 100 of us spread all across the world, um, that it's a little bit harder to have the whole hands, but we still have them. And they're part of our culture where anyone can ask a question about anything. And that was also at the beginning, people didn't believe me, right? They're like, okay, well, the boss likes you the best. So I'm going to tell you to ask him because if I ask him a tough question, I'm going to get fired. I'm like, guys, that's just not how it works, man. That's just not how it works. But, but people um, they'll listen to what you say but they will believe what you do. So within time, uh, people started to believe that culture, buy into the culture, buy into the vision. And then it went from, how do I get more people like, you know, they want to, they can work here. How can I for them? And, and all these things. And I think, the, and, and you know, this is the time recording this, it's the end of 2020, um, the pandemic happened this year, right? So that is something that could have been something that ended our company because we were in-person call center, you know, in a big room, you know, with air conditioning and, you know, it was a potential, you know, big issue when there's an airborne virus out there, right? So we all started working from home in the middle of March. Again, ahead of the curve, if your priority is your people, you don't wait for the government to mandate that you should protect your people, right? So we went virtual 100% and said, if this either works and we adapt or we die because we're not going to be in a call center waiting to see who's going to get sick and then, you know, get everyone sick because we're so close to each other. And we made it happen. And 90% of our company was able to adapt uh, to that new model because we have that culture. The, I, I, I think people, again, you know, culture is a buzzword. People say it all the time. Um, but, you know, if you have the right culture, a transparent, high performing uh, culture, these challenges come left and right, you know, Sam, all the time but you're able to adapt and work past them. And I think that if I didn't have that culture in place, I would not be in business here at the end of 2020. So I think that's going to be um, uh, the number one thing people are going to remember me by because it's impacted the largest amount of people in my life. I love that. So I want to go and talk about, I took some notes here. I want to ask a lot of questions. I don't know that we're going to get to everything in this episode. because We'll see how it goes. But I have a lot of questions uh, as of right now for you. So hopefully you're okay being in the hot seat and answering some. Go of for it. Uh, Go for it, man. No but let's, let's talk about the, uh, b before we dive into kind of your past. Let's just when you are making that transition um, from Microsoft to um, to being your own entrepreneur. Uh, who were your biggest naysayers? Because because again, this is like. You see this in certain cultures where when somebody tries to go against the grain of like what um, celebrity status is from an employment perspective and go against the grain, it's not like it's some, I know people who are 
disowned. Like they, they literally, their parents won't talk to them. Like it's bad. So I know that this happens, but like who were your biggest naysayers and how did you, um, I'm going to say silence them in your own mind, not rudely to them, but how did you get past that, the, those objections in your own mind? Uh, that's a really good question, man. And they, I think it's, you, you, I, have you gone through this transition? That's that sounds like someone that's actually gone through that, right? So uh, the biggest naysayers that actually said no to me or uh, gave me signals that this was not a good idea was my my, my friend, my sphere, my close sphere, my friends, uh, other engineers, other you know uh, high ranking employees who were doing great in their careers, and maybe some of them weren't doing so great. But they're like, man, you can't do that. That's crazy, right? I don't think that's going to work. You know, I, I, you know, and, and kind of, you know, we're not encouraging. They were not encouraging. And some of them meant well. Some of them maybe didn't. Um, they're like, man, this is a big risk. Got to be careful with those things, right? And my parents, let me tell you about this. So my parents, I knew were going to be against this. I knew 100%. They didn't even have to tell me, Sam. But you have that voice internalized, right? I mean, you know, if, if you know what, I mean, it's, it's there. Even if they didn't say it, I didn't tell them until I actually had done it. <laughs> I, did, I did not involve them in that discussion and that decision because I, I, I kind of knew where they were kind of come from. And again, they're coming from love. They're coming from, you know, caring for you and not wanting anything bad to happen to you. Um, but it was just not going to be something that was going to help and fulfill me. Right. So it's a, sometimes you have to make those decisions alone and you have to own it alone. Right. Cause let me tell you again, these last five years that with this company and these last seven years as an entrepreneur, I've had highs and lows, man. It's been sometimes, you know, you're down to like, man, I'm, I'm down to my last, well, not my last dollar, but I've depleted my, 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 uh, my savings. Right. I have, you know, really got dug, dug into, uh, you know, I'm not the, the super success story that people love to hear when you leave a cushy corporate job, right? And you have to push through. There is no turning back. There is no asking mom and dad for help. There is no asking, you know, my friends for help. It's like you got your back is to the wall. And that is when I've made some of the toughest decisions, the most positive toughest decisions I've ever had to make was when my back was to the wall. So I'm actually grateful for those situations and grateful for those experiences. You, you, don't, you don't make it without those things, right? And I kind of knew, this is funny, I kind of knew going into it, I'm like, this is going to be the hardest thing I've ever done. I knew it. I like, I mentally kind of like, this is going to be hard. And, and, and I'm going to be in those situations, right? Where it's like uncomfortable. I'm going to re remember what it feels like to be uncomfortable and to be anxious and to be nervous and have that feeling in the pit of your stomach. And I'm like, but that's, that's part of the game, right? The highs are high. The lows can be low. You got to make sure you can deal with both because it's, if you're in it, if you, if you, if you feel like you're in it for the long haul, you've got to understand that those things are going to happen. Right. And you're going to push through. It's not like the profiles you see in Forbes magazine or Inc or entrepreneur magazine. That is a snapshot. That is a moment, right? There's a process to get there. And there's a process after that. And all of those have highs and lows. What you have to kind of be really, really clear with yourself. You have to level with yourself at some point when you do things, something like this and go, why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? Because if it's just for the money, you're going to be out of the game quickly, right? Because the moment you're not making that money, the moment you run through a rough patch, the moment the pandemic hits and it's on the line again, you're like, this is too much for me, man. I just want to get make money. Let me go back to my six figure job where I just had to come into work every day and do what I did and I was gone, right? So, so you have to kind of be really clear about those things. So, I mean, that's a long winded answer to your question, but there was a lot of, you know, influences there. Um, but I had to say my, my, my sphere, my friends and my parents, even though they didn't chime in, they were there in your head. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to think about it. you're pretty much programmed by the time you're eight to 10 years old with all of the, even, and this is what's fascinating. Even if they never, even if they were always positive to you verbally, but like you said, what you do is way more important than what they say. Right. And, and this is, I, I bring this up with all of the love and respect for my, my parents and my whole family. Okay. We were taught Robert Kiyosaki. We were taught Zig Ziglar. We were taught Dale Carnegie. We were taught, like we read all these books. We studied them in our homeschool yet. We were modeled. Our parents were poor. I mean, I'm the seventh of 11 kids and it, it, there just wasn't a lot of money going around. My dad, mom, they were pizza hut drivers. And then my dad finally started working for, for century link um, as a DSL troubleshooter, but it wasn't like there was lots of money. And so, and, and for whatever reason, and again, that's not to look bad on anybody, but 
it took a lot to like, okay, we've been modeled this poverty and that's where a lot of us grew up in and where a lot of us ended. And then it took years and over time, a lot of mental gymnastics to actually start believing yeah. the successful people we were authors we were reading and, and becoming associated with because we were taught the cognitive dissonance was we were taught this. And then it was as if our parents were trying this and it wasn't working. And so we're like, well, that doesn't work. So that was my mental gymnastics is, and, and I don't think it was intended that way. It just is. I tell my wife all the time, we're going to screw up our kids. And so she stresses out. I'm like, how do we not screw up our kids? I'm like, no matter what you do, if you, if that, you're see, what, you, if that, you're like, what, once you get past that, that whatever you do, you're going to make, there's going to be, there's the two sides, the two sides to that coin. Oh yeah. There's two sides to those coins. If you coddle them too much, you're going to make them too soft. If you're military with them, there's going to be something lacking there. But if you kind of figure out that there's two sides to every coin, you just try to do your best. You kind of let go of the, you stop judging yourself. That makes sense, Sam? You stop being so hard on yourself and go, we're just doing the best we can. And, 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 and as I'm, I'm a parent now, I've got two small kids. I'm like, you know, the empathy I have for my parents now is through the roof, man. I'm like, holy cow. And, and I knew what they lived through when they were young. I mean, you know, they had a lot of issues. You know, they grew up in Mexico. There was a huge mega economic crisis in the time. I'm like, how did these people do it, man? I, again, just go, just coming from love and empathy and going, yeah, exactly. I 100% agree with what you said. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just funny. So understanding that, um, not to be too hard on yourself, but those, those internal voices, those naysayers, even the people who are super supportive on the outside, um, you, you're already programmed with them looking down on certain decisions because of their, their past experiences. So it's a mental gymnastics that uh, one, um, everybody's going to have to go through no matter where you came from, you're going to have to go through something of uh, some sort of that to get over that. And two, uh, in my experience, it's easiest with a coach. So find an industry that you want to be in and go find somebody who's been through that. If, if and we're going to talk about this because I think real estate's part of your game, but uh, listening to you, I think it's more than about real estate. Real estate's the, the vessel, the method. Uh, it's the widget, you could say, but what you're really doing in life is way bigger than real estate ever is going to be. And so I want to talk about that, but um, what was that? So I don't know if you, you probably read The Dream Giver, the book by uh, George Wilkinson, or I, I think it's George Wilkinson. I don't know. Last name's Wilkinson. I'm pretty sure. Um <laughs> Anyways, Bruce Wilkinson, I think it's Bruce Wilkinson. Anyways, the, the, this book talks about like a white feather, the dream or the realization of, man, I'm building somebody else's dream, not mine. Um, up until the point you, you made it to America, you made your dream come true as what it was, but really it's not that you didn't accomplish that dream. It's sometimes we accomplish our dreams and now we need a dream bigger. And I think that that's a, it's a natural transition. And a lot of people, they make it to their dream and we get caught in this society of you should be happy that you, you should be content that you accomplished one dream in life. You should be okay with that rather than seeking to accomplish more dreams. There's a contentment that at least if I stop while I'm ahead, then I'm ahead. And really you stop dreaming. You stop going for those things. So what was the, the white feather of like, how did you recognize that you're, you're in a plateau. Cause that's a, some people like, are, am I in a plateau? Am I really in a plateau in my business? Am I just feeling that way? Cause my wife yelled at me this morning or we got in a fight or whatever. Like, how do you know, okay, I'm definitely in a plateau in my business and uh, I have a dream and I want to go for the next dream. Not that you didn't already accomplish a dream, but like, I want to go for the next dream. Yeah. So uh, yeah, definitely. I, I, I agree with that. that. That happens. Right. So for me, the first time that happened, was was at Microsoft, right? Because you know I accomplished my dream at 24. You know when I you know I was actually 23 when I joined the company full time, right? So it was like, and I remember this. My first boss was like, I think it was like like 50 at the time. He goes, Gus, I love it. You're here, man. You're great. But you know what? I secretly feel sorry for you. I'm like why, boss? Because like, this is the best job I've ever had, bro. This is the best company I've ever worked for. And like, but I'm 50, and I'm gonna be here till I die. This company, right? You're 24. This is a weird situation for you to be in. I did not know what he was talking about at the time. I had no, I'm like, I thought it was like a funny, that's a weird thing to say to someone. And then later I'm like, I a hundred percent get what he's saying, right? Because if I wanted to have a cushy corporate job and kind of cruise, I think it's easier to do that at 50 than it is at 24. Cause I had, I was hungry, right? And as soon as I, that hunger stopped being filled with that job, with that career, 
you, you start to see these signs. You start to see these signs. You start to see. So for me, it was number one, just not feeling the energy. Not feel, it got harder to go to work. Okay, well, let me just change teams. It got harder with the new team. You didn't have that energy to excel and be number one and just, just be hungry about it, right? And then number two, I started getting more passionate about my hobbies. I would fundraise for nonprofits. I, would, I realized I was an amazing salesperson because I could go tell people, and I raised $300,000 from my school in Mexico, by the way, from, from people at Microsoft, just knocking on doors and, and, and chatting with them on IM. I, I, I was like, hey, man, you got to give money to our school. Got to give back, bro. Like right now, I'm, I'm after you. I'm going after you. That was my first lead generation, lead follow-up business for a nonprofit while I was working full-time at Microsoft. I'm like, hey, this, this sales thing is actually, I, I get it. I'm actually pretty good at this. And then, you know, and then helping my wife with the real estate team and doing this and doing that. I, the, the, your passion is hard to hide, right? It, 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 well, I'll say another way. It's easy to ignore, uh, you know, because, yeah, oh, yeah, that's my hobby. That's not my thing. Like, why isn't that your thing? Why are you doing what you're actually good at? Why aren't you doing what you're passionate about? And I think everyone has to come to a point in their lives where they either pay attention and lean into that, or they kind of accept that that's going to be something they do on the weekends, they do at night, they do every now and then, because that's not going to be uh, uh, the main focus of your life. So, I mean, th there's a comes a point. And for me, I'm going to be really honest with you and your audience with this. For me, that moment was when my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at 65, man. 65. And I was like, you know, the, the age sometimes people associate with, I'm retired, I'm going to enjoy life. I've got another 30 years to kind of play around and enjoy things. I don't know if people know much about that disease, but it's a ticking time. I mean, your life is essentially a downhill from there. There's no going back. There's no cure. There is no treatment, right? In reality. So that for me was like, if you're not making the choices to, to define your life and lean into the things you, you like and, and are passionate about and, and they can lead somewhere. If you don't do that now, when are you going to do it? Right. That for me was at the, one of those watershed moments of I'm either going to do this now and die trying and, and, you know, die on that hill or, 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 and go back and, you know, with my tail between my legs, I tried it, man. I gave him, I gave it a shot. I, I bet on myself and I failed, but I bet on myself. What about you? Or whatever. Yeah, you got a bigger house than me, you know, but I gave myself a shot at some point and, and, and I made peace with that, that risk. I'm a very risk averse. I don't, I don't want people to get the wrong impression that I'm this amazing blazing entrepreneur. I am a very risk averse person, right? Like this is, this is just who I am, but it doesn't mean that I didn't have big dreams. So that was my, being at Microsoft was my first big dream, but it took me a little while to realize that I had a bigger one, but that was the thing that really pushed me uh, to make that decision. Yeah, I, I, I want to talk, I want to hit on two key things there. One that you kind of glanced over almost, almost comically, but I think that it's crucial that, um, the, especially the people listening, you're thinking about who is this for me? For me, um, I was about five, six years old and I'd taken a trip out to the dump with my grandpa and uh, we were on our way back, old Ford Ranger pickup, metal grade on the back, um, and windows down, warm summer air blowing in, the radio's on, and, and we're driving, and he reaches over, turns down the radio, puts his, his hand on my knee and says, Sam, you have a voice that's pleasant to listen to. You could be a great leader one day, maybe even be on the radio. Now, I don't, I don't understand what, and then, then you just turn the radio back up and we went on our way. Now, the, the thing that was so fascinating about this is I consciously remember that that was like a bad thing. Again, th think of this, I'm six years old. I'm only two, year, two years away from my programming being done from, from psychologically uh, my childhood. So you think, well, that's really early to have this memory. It's really not. But I knew that having a radio voice was not a compliment. Like I, I understood that that was not the compliment that I wanted, okay? But- so that kind of just happened, but it's that one thing that had that not been told to me, I probably would not have the confidence to do the podcast. I probably would not have the confidence to travel uh, the country and the world speaking on stage because I believed at, at some point I had this call back to a memory because somebody had instilled that into me that um, I have a voice of leadership. I have a voice that people like listening to, whether that's true or not, I have no idea, but I believe it's true. And so it's true for 100%. me, you know, whether 100%. you're like, no, I turn it off. I actually turn down the volume when Sam speaks. Okay, whatever. 
Um, good for you. You miss a lot of good things. Um, but, but here's the deal. You had somebody at your work who, when you first got there, said, man, I feel bad for you. And, and maybe at the time you're like, oh, whatever. But it's that, that that's the seed, man. And every one of us, I honestly believe this, every one of us has that seed planted in us by a mentor who really believed in us at some point in our life. And I would invite you to go search your soul for what was that seed? What was the one compliment that somebody gave you that seemed out of left field, that seemed like, where'd that come from? That was nothing to do with what's going on. But that's when truth was spoke to your identity and you you actually have the ability to develop that. I, I think that everybody has that. If you haven't had that, give me a call because I want to help help you identify whatever it is. <laughs> Find it. Find yeah. it. It's there. It's just, it, we were yeah. paying attention, right? 100%. And then the second thing you said, and again, these are these are just things to think about as, as you're listening to this. Um, you had a realization that you had a clock and that clock was ticking. And that was when your mom got 100%. Alzheimer's. For me, my realization of like, oh, life is real and it's not as, when we're young, we all think we're invincible, okay? Like maybe not so young. Some people still believe that when they're 50s. That's, that's awesome for them. Um, but for me, it was when my little sister, she got diagnosed with cancer. 2016, Halloween, uh, find out oh, she's been diagnosed with cancer. And that's when I, like my whole mindset shifted. Okay, um, nobody in our family is really financially prepared that if we needed to fully financially support my sister for the remainder of her life, which is an unknown amount of time with the type of cancer she has, um, and if there was incurred medical bills and all, all these things, nobody in our family is really financially prepared to do that fully. And not only that, I had been working in a, a career and been given mentorship by multimillionaires where I had an actual real ability to build a business that could do that. And, and so I think everybody, we the clock doesn't have to be something in the distance. You don't have to wait till you have something tragic happen to you. You can choose Find his experience, my experience. You can find other people's experiences and make that your clock and, and help that give you the inspiration and motivation to get, get moving. It doesn't have to be something that is directly negative to you. You can learn the wisest people learn from other people's mistakes. They don't go through the mistakes themselves. Um, and so, so just think about that. What could be my clock? Why would I really be motivated to go do something? It might be for your family. It might be for um, kids in Africa. It might be for something else. But what is your clock? Um, and when are you going to get that started? So uh, I just love that. I, I think I want to. Um, so when, when you did tra transfer over, you went from corporate employee to real estate. Your wife had gotten her license. She was killing it, right? Eight homes a year. Not killing it, but. <laughs> that, that's for the that's, times. That was not doing bad. It was not doing bad. Though. Even in today's market, I know lots of real estate agents who aren't closing eight homes a year, which um, is uh, not to say good or bad about anybody, but I know it happens. So even eight homes a year in 2008, that's a, that's a phenomenal thing as it is because there's people now who aren't doing that. Um, that could be that there's like everybody and their dog is a real estate agent, but, um, <laughs> but uh, was it really real estate that you're so passionate about or is it kind of the, the life that of an entrepreneur offers you? Cause it definitely sounds like right now you're more in a position of building and you like the idea of building and constructing companies and offering a potential or a different experience to people. It's not necessarily the real estate. Um, so can you speak to that a little bit? Like what, what do you believe it really is that you're so passionate about? Oh, I a hundred percent agree with that, Sam. It, it, it's, it's not looking back on it. Uh, real estate was the way that it approached me, that entrepreneurship and that life and that possibility. It's the way that it entered my life. A hundred percent agree with that. hundred percent agree with that because that was the way it happened. Before that though, it was like through that nonprofit work that I did, right? It was like, Hey, you know, uh, here's a, like a sales activity. Here's talking to people who's making deals happen. Here's, I had, I would have lunch with like vice presidents and executives of my, that I would have never spoken to. And I went there to meet them and ask them for money. That was my, that, like, go, like, here's the pitch. And I walked away with a $10,000 check. Like, oh, wow, that was easy. So, you know, it was those kinds of experiences that opened my eyes that, hey, I have a skill set and it's, and, I, and I'm not using it at all. 
I have potential. I'm, I'm talented. I've got like something, you know, that, that radio voice, right? It's like, hey, there's something there um, that, that I'm meant to do, right? So, so real estate was the first vessel that, 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 that just came, it got in front of me. My wife was licensed. She wanted to build a team. She wanted to increase her sales. And I'm like, I can do help with that. Let me take a, 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 I told her, I'm going to take a six month hiatus from, from Microsoft and I'm going to go back or I'm going to go to the next company. I'm going to, but it's six, I'm going to take six months. I'm going to build your team into like a powerhouse. Um, and I, I never look back because I'm like, holy cow, this is much more interesting for me. And I have much more uh, of a, ch- I'm bidding on myself and I'm giving myself a chance to really use that potential much more so than I ever could in, in the role I was in at Microsoft. Yeah, I think that that's the, the crucial thing. Um, the reason I want to bring that up and, and highlight that is every one of us, again, you are worth being remembered and you have a unique skill to offer. And, and this is this is what I honestly believe about um, anybody. And I, I as, as an employer, I understand this, but you do not pay somebody, in my opinion, you do not pay somebody for the skill you possess or they possess. You pay somebody for the extrinsic team building energy, uh, whatever it's called, creativity. That's what you're paying somebody for. You're not paying them to to do the actual work, the technical, practical work. And at any point in time, you could be the best coder. You could be the best software engineer. You could be the best one of any of these things. And if you can't collaborate, if you can't actually maintain a culture, if you can't um, be a, a net profit to the company, on, in other areas, no matter how good you are, they'll fire you because you, you aren't adding the value. And the, the trick is to find out and identify why is your employer actually paying you? Because it's not because of the skill that you're prov- providing. It's not because you can flip a hamburger. They have machines that can flip hamburgers, right? It's not because of that. So why are they actually paying you? And then how can you take that skill of why they're actually paying you and apply it to somewhere else that will pay you better. And that's what I see that you did. You took your skills of why you actually got the job in the first place, that hunger, that fire, the the creativity, the collaboration. And you said, look, I could keep doing this here in Microsoft, or I can go do these same skills somewhere else and make a significantly better life for not just myself, but teach others to do the same and invite other people into that culture. And, And that's what I love so much about your story is you were able to do that. Now let's talk about the, uh, the company that you've built. Cause this is, I don't understand Mexico and, and how it works. So I want to dig a little bit more into this. When you say it's an yeah. adversarial relationship between the employer and the employee, what does that mean? Like, do they, is it like 19, uh, 1940s or, or earlier when they're, they're literally turning guns on their people, um, <laughs> forcing them to work in the steel mills, uh, and executing anybody who doesn't want to work and go on strike. Like, cause that happened in America at Carnegie's company. So like, um, <laughs> this is crazy stuff that's happened in the past in America, but like, what does that mean when you say that? Yeah. And that's a really good question. So I think w- what I mean when I say that is that it's a very paternalistic culture uh, and, and, and it's, hierarchy is huge. Uh, you know uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, deference to, to hierarchy uh, a lot of, you know, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the founder, I'm the boss, Mr. Gustavo, you know, and, 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 and if people don't show you deference, if they don't show submission, if they don't show obedience, that's a problematic employee. And, and something that, that's kind of different between the U.S. and Mexico is the labor laws in Mexico are actually, you know, much stricter than in the U.S., like way stricter. Like the, the, at least on paper, people are supposed to get more mandated benefits, mandated rights, mandated law, all these things but there's always a way around them, right? And that's also a very Mexican thing. If you don't like laws, you kind of find a way to skirt them. Um, and, 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 and these companies tend to have these huge labor lawyer departments in the company. And like, hey, who's your labor lawyer? Why would I need a labor lawyer in my call? Like a, like a staff person, like a, why? Like, oh yeah, well, to, to fight against your, to protect you from the employees. That's why you need them, right? Because, you know, and, they, and I'm talking about things like severance, workers' comp stuff, you know, like they, they can, it's very easy to file a lawsuit and to complain against, against the company. Let me tell you, this is a crazy, crazy story. I had a labor lawyer the first year, and I think they had to protect me from 10 or 12, uh, you know, com- formal complaints from, from workers. I got rid of that lawyer, and I got rid of the whole legal structure they made for me. In the four years since, I think I've had one complaint from workers without the lawyer. 
They were complaining about the lawyer. That's what they were complaining about. Because these people treated them like dirt, treated them like the, like, like the enemy. It was their job. That's, what the, that's the mindset they brought to the company. I'm like, bro, you're killing my company with this attitude. And like, no, Gus, it's because you don't know how things work here. Like, no, my man, you don't know how things work here. I, our company, like, you are not understanding how what we're trying to build. So you got to go. And let's trash everything you did last year because it is useless and worthless to the kind And again, it took me a while. To, I, I'm not going to say I was brilliant and knew this. I came to that, this realization, you know, a little bit late, in my, in my honest opinion. Um, but I made the change, right? And we, and we stopped it. And I, I was able to kind of prove the point that no, it doesn't have to be adversarial. You, as, as business owners, we, we take the first, it's, it's, a, it's an aggression when you have things like that. You're setting the table for the kind of relationship you want when you have someone like that to be your enforcer, right? To be to intimidated. And this is like from the 40s, or the 20s or whatever. This is, this is the same attitude. It's coming from the same place. You have to beat people into submission. And, and it's just not a, a proper way to run a company. And I'm not saying that's where that's that's how all companies in Mexico are. They're not. I mean, there's a lot of great, very modern companies in Mexico. Um, but but in the area I was, it's not one of the big cities. It's a medium-sized city, very conservative area in that aspect. So I've been very disruptive, right? In that sense, in my in my area, my community, my state, my region, by being different. And I had a consultant once come in, they were helping us with some other activities. They did a they did a survey, and they're you know of of, of employee satisfaction and you know and, all, and a bunch of things and they're like Gus, I've I've only I've evaluated hundred companies right, and I've only ever seen three companies score above this this threshold of like X like 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 triple A best company right. I've only ever had three companies of these hundreds. Where do you think you are? Like I am absolutely certain I'm above that threshold. And go yeah, you're the fourth one. I'm, I'm, I can't believe it. And they go, and you guys are amazing. Like, yeah, yeah, we do well. I told them, but I'm not comparing myself to these companies around me. This is not my competition. My competition is in the U.S. and Toronto and New York City and San Diego and Los Angeles, right? And against them, I'm middle. I'm still feel that I'm middle of the pack. I'm not the top one percent. Sure. You're comparing me against the wrong peer group, right? So I think all of the and I, and I don't want I don't open those things up to brag. I bring those things up to say that there's a different way to do things and places like the U S are showing us the way. Right. And, and again, but you can, you can find these relations, these issues in companies, even in the States. I'm not saying that the, the U S is, is immune to this, but it is a place where I learned there's a different way to do it. Right. So, so I mean, it's a long way to answer that question, but the, but that's where it was. Right. It was that, um, you know, labor lawyer kind of role uh, that people felt that was essential and necessary. And it kind of proved them wrong. Yeah, no, I, I think that's uh, crucial. I, I've been uh, slowly over, I mean, the last five years, it's taken me a long time. You thought it took you a long time for two or three years. It's taken me a lot longer <laughs> to figure out like what type of cultures that I actually want and what's really important to me in a culture in my company and what's not so important. Uh, and I've, I've started creating like little axioms of like, <laughs> I want accountability over responsibility. Like I want people who are going to at least return and report to me. And if they have a problem, they're going to proactively ask me rather than somebody who like maybe gets done what I ask them to, or is able to respond, but it requires me to babysit them and ask them if they did it. Like that's useless. Like I do not want any 100%. of that. If I have to choose an accountable person over a responsible person, I'll choose accountability every day of the week. I can train responsibility. I can train you to do what you need to do. But if you don't, or if you're not naturally inclined to like seek, be assertive, want more information and, and report back, it's, it's hard. That's a hard thing. It's a harder habit to train into somebody rather than to Absolutely. somebody to do their job. Right. So that's one, obviously uh, you're worth being remembered. It's all about like the other thing that's big in my company. Uh, Cause I'm part of a, a, a very large organization and across the organization, there's not a lot of collaboration. Like there's these separate teams and you see this in real estate too, where you have like Caldwell banker, but Caldwell banker in Dallas doesn't necessarily the umbrella have banker yeah. in in Austin because they're two different companies and they're two different owners and they're two different territories and they're in competition. And so they're not sharing secrets. And, um, and you see that it happens in all types of industries. For me, I want to create a culture of like, because I believe that you're worth being remembered, you're breathing, you're a human being. Um, then I don't care who you are. I'm going to make enough money for myself that I can then have the time 
to help you. And there, there's 30 million people, 330 million people in America, 8 billion people across the world. Like there's enough people out there for everybody to win. There's so much out there for everybody to win. Uh, and so um, understanding that we're not competing against other companies, we're competing against people's psychology. That, like that's the biggest thing we're competing against and attention. And it's not a, against other companies. It's, a, it's against a cell phone. It's against um, sleeping. It's against overeating. It's against depression, anxiety. Um, like that's what we're competing against. It's not a, like any person in my industry I want to help you. Like, give me a call. I'll give you a call and help you, you know, because I want that type of success. So it took me five years. I'm just starting to learn it and document like what type of culture I'm committed to, but uh, good on you for figuring it out sooner than I did. Yeah. Well, you know, I was also, you know, when I did it, I was in my mid thirties when I did this, right. When I kind of realized, so, you know, I kind of had that, you know, uh, uh, everything you did in the past, like Steve Jobs, you know, said in that speech, you can only connect the dots looking backwards. Mm -hmm. There is no way to kind of, there's no meaningful way to kind of always know where you're going to go in the future. When you go backwards and you're look and you're trying to, trying to live that purpose driven life and that mission driven life, like, Oh, okay. That's why I needed those kind of experiences. So my experiences helped me, you know, give me a little bit of an edge. I mean, talking to you, I feel better because I thought I was taking, it took me forever. But I'm like, you know, I, I appreciate that comment. <laughs> yes, yeah. thanks. Yeah, no, that's great. So i um, curious if, if somebody listening was like, hey, actually, I would love to talk to Gus, have a conversation with him, maybe work for him, who knows, um, get, see what he's doing, see his operation. Um, where would they contact you? Like, are you on, where's the best place to get a hold of you, your team, learn more about your company and your mission and, and help you be remembered more? Uh, that is powerisa.com, my, my, my company website. That's the best way to kind of reach out and kind of see what we're doing. Also, I'm, I'm really active on Facebook. If you look for my, my, my company, powerisa.com, I'm going to pop up. I have a Facebook group that's free to join. People want to continue the conversation in there. Um, all those things, you know, are available. Um, so my, my, my website and, and Facebook are the best ways to find me. Awesome. Fantastic. Now this is a second to the last section called legacy on rapid fire. One word, one sentence answers um, to five questions. You ready to go? Go for it. Okay. Legacy on rapid fire begins now. What do you believe is holding you back from reaching the next level of your legacy today? Fear of losing what I've accomplished a hundred percent. And what do you believe the hardest thing you've ever accomplished has been? The courage to bet on myself. And what is your greatest success to this point in your life? Building an organization with an open culture. And what is one mindset, habit, or behavior um, that you believe contributes the most to your success? Not being too hard on myself. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Love it. And what's one or two books that you think uh, the Fuel Your Legacy audience could really benefit from? So a uh, gr- great question. I always struggle with this, you know, because, uh, you know, one of the pivotal books for me that I read when I was 18, 19 years old was actually Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And, you know, you either love that book or you hate that book or the author somehow. Um, but I'm like, that's just the truth, man. I read that. It's one of those seeds, right? It's one of those seeds. It, it, I didn't act on it for years later, but that book planted a seed. My wife actually gave it to me. It was a real entrepreneur, like the, the purebred entrepreneur, the family's her. And she put that book in front of me. It's like, you should read this. I think this is going to change your mindset. And I needed a mindset shift, but it took me a decade to, to put it into practice because it was that ingrained, that uh, difficult to move. Uh, like I said, that programming, right? So uh, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, pivotal, pivotal book. Another one that I think is unbelievably uh, important is The One Thing by Gary Keller. And I'm with Keller Williams, I'm a little biased, but that's a great, great, great book uh, to help you kind of put things in, into perspective and help plan out your day. I love that. That is fascinating. I did not know that Gary Keller was one who started Keller Williams. Oh, no way. He, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's the founder. He's a co- co-founder and just the driving force of it throughout the yeah, last 30 years. Yeah, it's an amazing guy. Love to learn new things. Cool. So here's the final question. And hopefully you're prepared for this because you did listen to an episode before. But this is my favorite question. And this is honestly why I do what I do. Uh, and we've, we've talked about it. We've skirted around it. But we're going to pretend that you've died. You're dead. You're six generations from now. So this is your great, 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 great grandchildren. They're sitting around the kitchen table discussing um, what your life meant, the impact you had on society, what your legacy is. What do you want them to be saying about your legacy six generations from now? So I want them to say, man, 
Gus was an unbelievably kind, open person. And man, did he make a difference in all of these people's lives. Because even six generations later, they speak fondly and with respect about him. Who else can you think of that people remember that way? Because lo and behold, that's what people are going to remember. It's not just, maybe you made a ton of money. The people whose lives you changed, it wasn't because you made a ton of money. It's what you did to, to, to be kind to them and to make them feel important and empowered. So that, that's what I feel is going to, I would love it. I would love, feel honored uh, if people, you know, later in life, you know, down the line, uh, remember me for that. Fantastic. I love that. Thank you so much. And uh, I super appreciate again for you coming on the show today and sharing your time, your, your expertise and your skills and, and just your, your experience. This is where we all get to grow and become more every day. And we couldn't do it without great guests and people like you. So I uh, just want to express my appreciation from, from all of my audience to you uh, for, for doing that. And we'll get this shared out and hopefully some people will reach out to you uh, and at least friend or like or follow your business on Facebook so they can get more information there. Love it, Sam. Thanks so much. It's been great. Yeah, no problem. And we'll catch you guys next time on the Fuel Your Legacy show. And always remember that you are worth being remembered. Thanks for joining us. If what you heard today resonates with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me. And if you do give me a shout out, I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. Thanks to all of those who've left a review. It helps spread the message of what it takes to build a legacy that lasts. And we'll catch you next time on Fuel Your Legacy.